Welcome everyone to our Parent Academy tonight on concussions, symptoms, effects, and treatment for our students. and collaborate with in helping our students. So please know that tonight's report um, presentation will be recorded and after the presentation the link that you joined um, with us tonight is also the link that you will access the recording from. Um, at the end of Dr. Zuniga's uh, uh, presentation we will have a question and answer time. 
If you have questions as we go through, please just put them in the chat and we'll make sure that we fill those to him as um, when that time comes. So it is my honor to introduce Dr. Nicholas Piazzanita. Um, he with UC Health Sports Medicine. He is the UC Health Southern Region, Regional Medical Director for Integrated Sports Medicine. Um, he was recently voted by his physician peers as a 2020 top doc in Colorado Springs. He is an accomplished primary care physician with board certification in family medicine and dual fellowship certifications in sports medicine and faculty development. He's a community physician at heart with a passion for all age groups and a compassion approach to all medical challenges. Dr. Keith Nita um, spent 26 years as a U.S. Army physician and um, moved back to Colorado Springs in 2008, retired as an Army physician in 2014, and um, has chosen to stay here in the Springs and um, work and serve his community. Dr. Keith Nita is a physician leader for UC's Health. You see how citywide concussion care program, which is uh, a new program that UCL is leading the way with other community partners such as Children's Hospital, Optum Medical Group, Peak Vista, Matthew UC Medical Group, and others um, that join in. Um, Dr. Cantonini has championed the art of integrating Colorado Springs vast medical talents and resources to create better solutions around complex topics topics such as concussion care. Dr. Kate Nita speaks and teaches on a broad list of topics that include adolescents, overuse injuries, sports performance, teenage baking carols, and much more. In fact, he will be back with us in January to uh, speak to us about baking and the effects and kind of the latest research and data out there. So without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our speaker tonight, and we certainly are grateful for you, and thank you for your gift of time. Great, thank you, Martha, for that kind and and rather thorough introduction. Uh, <laughs> as humbling as it is, uh, it is a pleasure to be here tonight uh, and joining you here from uh, our Academy District 20 Education Administrative Center. Uh, and so your team here has taken great care uh, getting me uh, online and, uh, and into uh, a talk. This uh, is unfortunately a common yet a complex uh, topic uh, across all sports. Uh, and, and I want to expand it to all activities because we here in Colorado um, find us on sides of hills and mountains doing you know, snowboarding and skiing and hiking. And so uh, this is a topic, you know, with all our activities can uh, particularly have a big meaning if uh, if we find ourselves uh, falling or injured in any way. So in talking about concussion care and the program that we've launched here in the last uh, really year and a half, uh, we've we've nestled it into uh, really four pillars and we're going to come back to these four pillars, but you see them listed on the title slide as discovery, access, align, treat. Uh, these four pillars have uh, deep meaning in the program and, and across all pillars uh, we're we're striking to uh, you know, strike a balance, a balance in uh, all the elements uh, that these pillars represent. Uh, elements of, uh, of identification, uh, elements of uh, direct care, uh, elements of education, uh, and definitely elements of, of change. Um, there is much, much research in this topic that we're going to review tonight. And, uh, you know, a lot of this research uh, is evolving, uh, and yet there's still a lot unknown uh, in this topic. So striking a balance uh, has great meaning uh, in this topic, and, and we as a large group uh, and really as a citywide uh, uh, collaboration find this balance important. Uh, the group uh, of just principal committee members uh, you see listed on this slide, and, uh, and I want to extend uh, a big thanks to Kevin Roberts. Uh, he's here with us tonight. Kevin is our supervising uh, athletic trainer, and uh, as such, uh, he has uh, put together a Safe Play series 
where you heard Martha talk about the next session, which is going to involve vaping and the risks and hazards of, of vaping in our in our youth. Uh, Kevin uh, is a principal uh, participant in this uh, Safe Play series, and tonight's uh, lecture is the inaugural uh, presentation uh, in that series, which you'll see extended through uh, this year and into 2021. So our objectives tonight are four. Uh, we're going to dive into this definition of what a sports or activity concussion represents. We're going to look at when and why you want to seek care, uh, care of a friend, a child, an athlete uh, who uh, may or has suspicion of a sports uh, or activity concussion. Um, we're going to talk about where in the concussion uh, assessment clinic, where that fits uh, and, and how that trajectory and care might look like as uh, as you might need care for a concussion uh, and we'll talk more about these concussion assessment clinics as they are here and new in Colorado Springs and then we'll finish up with uh, where to get more information on this topic um, as I mentioned already it's very complex it's changing with the research that uh, is co continuing to evolve you're going to see tonight uh, and I hope that there's uh, athletic trainers on the line tonight, uh, you know, dialing in, listening in, uh, because there's many things that I think tonight are even going to be eye-opening for them as they deal with their athletes on the field side and in the gymnasiums. So looking to uh, Albert Einstein, I want to kind of root us in a couple thoughts. One is, you know, as complex as this topic is, it's my job to try and make it simple. Uh, but I, I want to be careful and, and acknowledge up front that it's it's never going to be too simple uh, that uh, it will become uh, an item of, uh, of easy regard. Um, the second comment really applies to all you listeners out there, because as you listen to this dialogue tonight and take in uh, some of the information and data and details, it's really to you I look uh, to then turn and and possibly describe uh, a concussion uh, that might be evolving in front of you or uh, to take the next steps uh, as you simply hear them described today and, and apply your understanding of them um, and do it well enough that the person of interest gets the right care at the right time. And so that second statement there, um, very interested to come into your question and answer series at the end of our talk tonight. Um, to really understand what you learned tonight uh, and and may it be that I, I ask, you know, what are some of the things uh, that the, the lecture tonight offered you in terms of uh, long term learning and application? So when we started this project a year and a half ago, uh, we really arrived at three core uh, safeguards that we wanted to assure uh, all of our participants at the table but more importantly, the community that we were uh, serving uh, in the course of this program. And we wanted it to be convenient and so many access points across the city. We wanted it to represent high quality care, so it needed to follow the research. It needed to have expert participation among our partners, and uh, we needed to make sure that was all coordinated. As you'll see here in the discussion, there are many multidisciplinary members on this team, and as such, we need to coordinate the care uh, from point of injury to point of assessment through the primary care as well as especially care arms of uh, what might be needed for concussion care. I just want to start with a scenario uh, to highlight um, kind of ground us all in a patient case. Um, this is a case of a 16 year old female high school soccer player um, that during uh, late practice uh, you've, you've, you've started a discussion around you know, what happened yesterday, yesterday practice where she was striking through uh, the ball and her head collided with uh, a member of her team. Um, she, in fact, has a history of two prior concussions uh, that were uh, part of her last season events. Um, her symptoms today, so the day after, um, she's having headaches, she's having nausea, she describes a fog sensation, and um, she's having problems with equilibrium or balance. Um, she's having uh, more than typical adolescent fatigue uh, and she expresses uh, concern as she kind of uh, has some stress, some added stress uh, about homework and catching up and her uh, lack of ability to focus and retain the, the reading that uh, she's been, uh, you know, tasked and assigned to do in the past week. Um, so there's our patient. If you can just kind of conceptualize her as we start our, our presentation tonight, 
Um, the grayed out area will can come to the end of the talk as questions arise and kind of review her exam uh, and think about next steps. So in defining a sports concussion or an activity related discussion, uh, we naturally need to dive into this area of traumatic brain injury. And traumatic brain injury is a functional injury to the brain. And it's important um, as we look at uh, concussion, we all embrace and acknowledge the fact that as a functional injury, um, we're simply ruling out or we're simply assuring uh, our patient that there is no structural injury. And we'll see as we review the red flags, you know, the red flag items that um, would represent a structural injury. Those are items that would necessitate a higher level assessment or higher level imaging to identify a structural injury in the course of uh, trauma to the head. Um, youth sports uh, typically involve collisions, um, collisions with players, collisions with the ground, and it's this force of, of, of impact, whether it's a force traveling from the torso through the neck to the head or direct force to the, he to the head itself, where the brain sits in a suspended element uh, inside the skull. And with that suspension, with any force, it's shifted, it's, uh, it's moved forward and backward and side to side. And it's that impact, um, not just from the energy um, traveling to the head, but it's the impact of the brain against the skull wall, which uh, exacerbates or even further aggravates the concussion element uh, that causes a functional injury to the brain. So traumatic brain injuries um, range from mild to severe. And um, the symptoms um, directly correlate with, uh, with that severity, whether it's mild or severe. Um, you don't have to lose consciousness um, or have amnesia to have a diagnosis of concussion, but clearly um, those are uh, striking elements uh, of a concussion and are to be attended to appropriately. But in general, um, a sports concussion or an activity concussion is categorized as a mild traumatic brain injury. And as such, that's important for us to understand right off from the start. So I love this picture. I added it recently um, and uh, it really underlines the functional nature of a concussion because here you see uh, a brain and um, you see the, the many gyri and the convoluted uh, connections that um, make up uh, the brain. And uh, you see that with the brain uh, and its very complex uh, functions, that there are uh, different organizational areas across the brain where say you, you see uh, in this uh, frontal parietal area, um, you see some working memory and executive function. And then more forward in the forward part of the brain, you see this complex attention. Uh, and as we work uh, in a counterclockwise function uh, fashion, you see memory in the left temporal lobe and visual aspects uh, of coordination and eye movement uh, in, in that same uh, temporal uh, space. And moving to the posterior brain, you start to see uh, some speed and processing reaction time. And then finally in the back of the brain where you see the cerebellum, that's the warehouse. Uh, I should say powerhouse of balance and coordination in the body. And so where that energy gets transmitted, where that impact is uh, occurring, that will affect that segment of the brain that is just not working right. And it's a functional injury, not a structural injury to the brain. You can have many areas of the brain affected at once, um, or you can have very isolated areas of the brain affected. Um, and that's, uh, and that's certainly part of what we call our comprehensive workup is to delineate where that injury in fact is occurring. When we look at prevalence and the CDC uh, has great estimates uh, annually as we look at injuries, uh, we're, we're typically describing somewhere between uh, you know, 1.6 and 3.8 million at the highest ranges of uh, sports related concussion. Um, fortunately, the majority of these are in this mild class, uh, so 90 to 95%. Again, that fits beautifully into that definition of a sports concussion. Um, our deaths are very few and far in number, but um, certainly are a topic of great discussion and center around, as you see there, this second impact syndrome. And in that second impact syndrome, here is our athlete or here is our weekend warrior or our um, 
you know, our senior uh, adult who's out hiking on a trail who had fallen previously, had a head injury and has simply neglected or overlooked or just didn't attend to the signs of a concussion and then unfortunately endured yet a second concussion. And the impacts to the brain in a second scenario become particularly dangerous uh, and overwhelming for the brain and um, the physiologic and, and uh, functions that follow um, can lead to death. So I, I don't wanna um, marginalize uh, the sin significance and the severity here of a concussion, but in a setting where we're not uh, attentive and attuned to its symptoms, um, we can make some dramatic mistakes that can lead to uh, horrific outcomes. So even today, as I was seeing my patients in clinic today, and I was talking about being here tonight to several of them, uh, it, it was often the case where a lot of them would comment that, you know, that's a football injury, or I know what a concussion is. That, that's, that's what we see when we watch football or, you know, worry about football and its many injuries. And, and it's not far from the truth that football has a high uh, exposure rate. So injury rate per thousand, you know, football does have a, a leading role in that concussion scenario. But for sure, uh, you know, soccer, both men and boys, uh, you see uh, basketball, wrestling represented on the slide. Um, what's not here are, are many other sports, uh, you know, um, lacrosse uh, and many may it be because it's one of those rising um, popularity sports, but certainly um, we see a large number of concussions in lacrosse that even approach our injury rates we see in soccer. What is nice to also acknowledge is that it's a lot about how you approach the sport and um, that persona and uh, a good level of aggressiveness uh, is often part of uh, our incidence or injury rate um, position. Uh, you know, not all soccer players are created equal in their opportunity to have a concussion. And we see our strikers and forwards and our goalies as incurring higher uh, head injury rates than say forwards and fullbacks. Um, what also mentioned on the slide is that girls, uh, women tend to have a um, a greater or higher rate of repeat concussions. And so that repeat concussion rate um, becomes particularly challenging for us in our clinical practice because it, it's not that that second and third concussion um, will necessarily follow the simple resolution of a first concussion, but tends to be a little more prolonged, tends to be more elaborate in its uh, symptomatology. So we do take account uh, of, of continual concussions and what might it be that that athlete need an additional treatment now that this is a second or third concussion. I love this slide uh, and you're going to see some discussion about it later when we talk about the metabolic, the brain metabolic crisis. And this is uh, clearly stated uh, is a crisis. As you look across the X axis, you've got minutes. So minutes from con concussion where uh, at two minutes all the way out to 10 days. And then the Y axis, you see the percent normal. So even your calcium influx into the brain gets well up to nearly 500 times normal. Um, why is that important? As we have huge fluxes in these um, metabolites and electrolytes in the brain, um, like calcium, for example, it shuts down um, the vascular flow to the brain. That calcium um, explosion, if you will, uh, creates a vascular constriction blood flow doesn't travel, blood flow doesn't pass into the brain. And with that constriction, you have the uh, buildup of, of metabolites um, and you have the uh, absence of oxygen and nutrition and um, you have the lack of profusion in basic blood flow to the brain that essentially um, creates the whole cascade of symptom development. And, and with that symptom development, as the slide shows, it's not just minutes or even hours. You're gonna hear me underline the importance that even days after the concussion, we, parents, coaches, athletic trainers, need to be monitoring our athletes for symptom progression and new symptom arrival. And new symptoms can particularly be um, present uh, out through 10 days. Um, the other thing about this slide, parents, that I love 
is if you can um, acknowledge and, and imagine, you know, the brain starving. The brain is starving for nutrition and all of these free radicals. We're going to talk about um, how do we nutritionally approach our athlete um, in these 10 days to ensure they have the right nutrients, um, the right antioxidants, and how that can make a big difference uh, in their recovery. So I had mentioned early on that uh, you know this injury is a functional injury to the brain. Um, all of us in our uh, acute and urgent and emergency room settings need to be attentive to some of these signs or all of these signs that we, we um, acknowledge and describe as red flag symptoms or exam findings. These are the symptoms that require, that would um, direct uh, a higher level assessment whether that's in, a, in an emergency room setting, a hospital setting, whatever that might be. Um, they also generally um, dictate or encourage uh, the additional imaging that might be warranted to rule out, um, uh, say, a subdural bleed or something structurally in the brain that needs to have further uh, exploration or discovery. Uh, and so that's the worsening headache that's uh, severe and unrelenting. That's that repeated emesis. You know, a lot of these concussion cases, you may have emesis on the field, but it's that that's, you know, second and third episode of emesis that needs to be attended to. It's the change in the mental status, and it doesn't need to be declining, but it just may be off uh, in terms of their functional awareness, uh, in terms of their responsiveness. And again, I, I know we're dealing with our wonderful teenagers here. So you parents, and you primary care managers out there that know your, your patients and loved ones best, you know, that change in mental status is important to acknowledge. Um, a focal neurologic deficit, so something that's changing in regard to um, sensation or motor or, you know, our sensory organs, um, those are gonna be quickly picked up and examined. Uh, you know, the neck is particularly uh, important because the head and its brain uh, sits on a pendulum and we got to make sure the C-spine and the neck is not injured as part of this injury cascade. Um, insomnia, no question, there's, there's definitely and more typically sleep problems in our concussed athletes and activity uh, individuals that are injured, um, but if they have insomnia, which means they cannot sleep at all, that in particular uh, brings on a red flag concern. New onset seizures, you see the motor weakness, the change in speech, um, you know, this is important to know behavioral aspects that are, you know, scoring high on a structured test. Um, and these are things like, you know, someone who's not typically depressed, but now we are dealing with depression and irritability uh, and even suicidality. I mean, the extremes of depression um, are particular red flags that need to be dealt with. And then syncope meaning um, loss of consciousness. So, you know, passing out, um, that has to be attended to. So those are your red flags. These are the elements that you'll see in uh, any brochure that we have. Uh, this, is, this is to be attended to early on as we look at uh, and worry through uh, concerns of a concussion in, in a member of our team, a loved one, family member, or what have you. Here's the common symptoms. And this is what makes uh, concussion particularly uh, complex, is that they spread a whole spectrum and uh, there are three elements uh, in which a concussion affects us. Uh, we have a physical element of injury, we have a emotional element of injury, and we have a cognitive element of injury. And you'll see here in a moment, um, those, those can make up a broad scale of questions. But I wanted to give you a slide that has some of the most common symptoms. And then I wanted to highlight two of them on the slide. Because here in a few slides, I'm gonna talk about particularly those symptoms that lead to uh, prolonged concussion symptoms, prolonged recovery and concussion. And it's important early on in our discovery to identify fog and identify balance problems because these are the warning uh, signs for uh, the need to seek potentially higher level care. Higher level care meaning therapy, higher level care meaning uh, attention to sleep and nutrition, um, and maybe uh, you know getting a specialist involved. Uh, and so those are particularly important. Um, we're gonna turn the page here and talk about this post-concussion symptom scale. Um, it's a scored scale uh, and the score goes out of 132 points. 
And so there it is. It's got uh, 22 symptoms uh, that you see down the left column and they're scored zero to six. This is a scale that we've diligently um, spoke to and had instructions even as recently as two weeks ago uh, with many of our urgent care partners where you'll see it uh, in that setting. Um, you know, Kevin Roberts uh, is deploying this scale uh, on the field side and in the gyms with his athletic trainers here in D20. Um, it is a wonderful way to start the trend of symptom measurement and symptom accountability. And how it works is simply stated that the patient uh, is given the scale and is given the opportunity to uh, score the various symptoms from headache all the way down to visual problems. I love this scale because it crosses all three elements that we're focused on. It crosses, it crosses the physical stigmata of a concussion where you see headache and nausea and vomiting. It crosses um, the emotional stigmata of, of a concussion where you see uh, problems with sleep and nervousness and emotional changes. Um, and then you see the cognitive parts where you're feeling slow and foggy and difficult concentrating and difficulty remembering, remembering things. It's perfect. It's a perfect way uh, to trend symptoms and trend them in such a meaningful way that um, it's typically offered and completed uh, at the same time each day. And so it's a daily symptom scale. It's, it's not done two or three times a day. It's done daily, once a day, uh, and it's done in a sequential fashion so we can follow your symptom score uh, through time. What does the symptom score mean? I, I've instructed our urgent care teams, and it's based on research done nationally, uh, that any symptom score of 30 or higher um, should merit the additional assessment uh, either with our PCM partners, primary care managers, or with our urgent care, or certainly in the emergency room as these scores get even higher. Um, a score of 30 is a very strong predictor of uh, formidable concussion uh, symptoms lingering uh, past uh, what we'll see here in its 7 to 14 typical day resolution format. Um, and so this scale is helpful for you on the field side in any setting where you want to assess uh, your athlete. So my child has a concussion and so what do I do now? And I thought this slide was a good point to kind of pivot into uh, into the next steps that this talk is going to take us through. Um, for sure, we have a advice nurse here at UC Health uh, available through uh, our Monday through Friday uh, 8.30 to 7 p.m. time segment. They have a very nice protocol that we've developed in our group to walk you through uh, a concussion screen and um, a symptom review, and they will assist you in every regard possible to pursue what your next steps can be uh, and the recommendations related to that. Number two, and possibly even number one, is you know if you have any of these red flag symptoms, I just put three bullets in here to highlight some of them, but you know, loss of consciousness for any period, um, amnesia, you know, where you can't remember, and then of course those red flag symptoms. If you have any of those, the emergency department clearly is a great place for you to take your next steps. Um, urgent care, love our urgent care platform across the city. Um, it is a it is a platform that uh, I've been in and out of. Um, you've heard uh, that Optum is one of our team members. They're partnering with us in their urgent care setting um, to really set this stage that if we have an athlete entering at their level, um, particularly looking at the post-concussion symptom scale, scoring them out, looking for issues of concentration, looking for issues of balance and fog, that we can rapidly get them into this concussion assessment clinic that we will discuss here shortly. Certainly other symptoms, uh, mild symptoms, maybe the score on the scale is a 10, certainly less than 30. You know, your primary care physician, uh, primary care provider is also a great place to go get care, and that um, can uh, be a start point for you. Um, regardless, as I, I think this number five suggests, that scale and the monitoring of symptoms as they might be delayed over those 10 days are where you should be focusing your additional attention. How to avoid uh, prolonged recovery, and this is uh, really a big driving point here in our talk today. Uh, you can expect uh, in the general terms, 80 to 90% of our 
mild traumatic brain injuries as a result of a sports or activity concussion will resolve full symptoms within the seven to 14 days. It's that 20 to 10 percent, so 10 to 20 percent that are going to have prolonged symptoms. And it's it's our challenge to uh, early on identify who they might be and where they might need that care early on with intervention, accommodations, and what those might look like. You heard me go through this metabolic brain crisis with that graph. What's the best approach in terms of nutrition and antioxidants? Um, what should sleep look like and how should that be tailored the first 24 to 48 hours? And what's significant after that in terms of sleeping? Um, you know, again, we're in our population here in D20, we're, we're, we've are we got teenagers, love them to death. Um, and they have great reasons uh, to be tired and fatigued. Um, and many times uh, they find great reasons to, to nap and grab an extra moment or two to rest. But in the setting of a concussion, once they get after that 48 hours, we want to monitor their sleep patterns so that they set most of their circadian rhythms later into the evening in a normal rest cycle, sleep cycle. And we'll talk more about that. I have a separate slide. Number five is very important here. And coaches out there, uh, I hope you take heed here because if we don't discover and we don't identify that concussion early on and we wait uh, and we delay, uh, that individual has an eight times higher prolonged recovery period, eight times likely risk for a prolonged recovery period. Um, and how, how we look at this topic is we want to get these individuals back to school, back to class, back to their life, and eventually back to sport, but we got to get them identified early on. And as we delay, the implications are fairly high. So take you through a couple, a uh, handful of slides. We're going to move into intervention and treatment. I'm going to hammer home this sleep and physical rest with some interesting uh, recent research that's suggesting some activity as we pass our 48 hours of recovery. We'll talk about education interventions. You know, I can't miss these being here at D20, you know, in the education schoolhouse. I want to make sure um, we partner with uh, our teachers and counselors here. Um, we've got brain steps on the line tonight and we'll get some comments from her uh, to kind of uh, help us coordinate these very important things that are related to uh, education accommodation in a setting of a concussion and what that looks like. There's opportunity for physical and all parts rehab, rehab including neurocognitive rehab, and then I'll finish with talking about nutrition. Uh, I'm going to avoid any pharmacological presentation slides here tonight, but if you have pharmacological questions, um, I can answer those in the questionnaire and answering section at the end if, if so needed. So yes, uh, the, the first and the most important part of concussion care really sits in the first 24 to 48 hours where we basically unplug uh, our athlete uh, in the ways that uh, they really need some rest. Uh, and so that's quiet, dark uh, environments, that's uh, separation from their phones, their TVs, their, their computers, and that's really, the, as you see there, no screen time for that first 48 hours. Why is that important? The ocular neuro connection that um, is relevant to what you do with your phone, your TV, and your computer is exquisitely sensitive and activated that first 24 to 48 hours. And frankly, the brain, as you saw, uh, is just not ready to take on any new inputs. And so um, it could not be better said that uninterrupted rest and sleep that first 48 hours is the main focus. However, when you see that 48 hours pass by, then you know we need to start thinking about some mild activity. And this is where the recent research has really changed uh, uh, a lot of our formations in how we treat concussions after the 48 hours. And it wasn't, you know, but maybe 10 or 12 years ago where we had a, a week long period of uh, prescribed rest and sleep. But now in current day, modern research in concussions say that we encourage mild non-contact aerobic activity. And simply that's your walking 20 to 30 minutes, uh, you know, a day. So your athlete who is suffering from a concussion but has PE class, you know, could spend time outside of that PE class or during PE class 
you know, doing some mild aerobic activity, but not participating in what might be contact or risk based contact uh, care or, or activities in that class. Um, this should follow medical guidance and certainly primary care managers have a role here in, in guiding this, but in red and underlining the message here with activity, um, you really shouldn't see an aggravation of headache, aggravation of nausea, aggravation of dizziness. There should not be a profound uh, aggravation of those symptoms uh, as you embark on a walking program uh, day three and on with regard to uh, your exercise. For sure, you see that mention of the daily post concussion scale, and that's going to continue to be a driving force here as we trend your symptoms um, into this seven and 14 day uh, period. So activity is reasonable, but it needs to be uh, assigned and it needs to follow a mild non contact format. Education and what those interventions and accommodations look like and bullet one just underlines this important fact that you know 80 to 90 percent of our concussions are going to resolve with symptoms in 10 to 14 days. So prognosis is good um, with some very minimal accommodations, uh, you know, goes a long way and uh, the research bears that out in particular. Uh, and so these are school based uh, and counselor teacher consideration accommodations and for sure um, the school, the counselor, the teachers all need to weigh in on these uh, as the recommendations come across their desks. Um, my clinical assessment often is that these patients uh, that get some accommodations early on, um, they don't see me past 10 and 20 days from injury. And uh, it's simple, simple things like modifications in homework and, uh, and assignments uh, that are due uh, and providing a little more time and completion. Um, it might be delaying exams so that the symptoms don't interfere with testing. Uh, it might offer a, a late arrival or um, abbreviated sessions so that the nausea and the dizziness don't um, become an impediment during that class period where they can't focus or pay attention uh, to the details that the teacher is providing. Um, it's just that greater awareness in the assignments, the testing and the teaching that's happening that's uh, particularly helpful. And then the environment, uh, you know, some of the, the injuries do necessitate um, some sunglass or, or ear uh, plugs use where the sound and, and light uh, in the room may be an aggravator for the athlete. So clearly some opportunities for all of us to come together to set some accommodations where appropriate. Sports concussion and nutrition, love this topic. Mom, dads out there, you know, um, really attentive to the nutrition of our, our athletes. Um, but when a concussion occurs, hundreds of thousands of free radicals are released uh, in the body and in particular to the brain. And so these free radicals need to have their reciprocal antioxidants to uh, scavenge, to collect, to decompress, to neutralize these free radicals. Uh, and it's these free radicals that continue to exacerbate and cause symptom um, prolongation. And so love the fruits, love the vegetables, particularly those are bright in color. Um, you know, you see a full list here of berries, blueberries, strawberries, blackberries. You've got plums, lots of fruits, uh, lemons, uh, leafy vegetables. You know, couldn't be a better time in their life to start a salad, you know. Um, it's it's just there for you to take in and uh, um, I encourage you to explore uh, whatever it takes to get these uh, antioxidants on board. Um, certainly there are over the counter antioxidants um, and we could talk about those in the question and answer period, um, but foods, just great foods uh, that you put on the table um, in good varieties, you know, one fruit, one vegetables, um, do that in, in ways that help your athlete recover. Uh, this slide is, is that message. Neurocognitive and other rehab, and I can't step away from this topic tonight without, you know, mentioning in the complexity that some of our athletes, you know, you know that maybe four to five percent that have these prolonged symptoms, symptoms over four weeks. So now we're even in a smaller category. I mentioned four, five, six percent of the athletes where their vestibular imbalance issues are not resolving, where their fogginess and, and focus abilities are just not, not becoming clear. Um, it's that ocular double vision, blurred vision, 
you know, again, the post-concussion symptom score is going all the way out to 132. These are our athletes, uh, these are our, our patients that are gonna need additional attention. Um, and that attention may come in the form of uh, occupational therapy where visual uh, and, and visual function is restored, uh, memory therapy through our speech therapists. Um, we have our neurocognitive therapists that really form the backbone. We're gonna talk about them in detail, um, but neurology and neuro-ophthalmology uh, all have an important role in that. So here's your trajectory. I, I, I created this slide. I put the school-based uh, uh, team in the bubble. So you're, you're in the bubble in the slide. Below the slide are other members, other areas where we can discover concussions. Um, you know, they'll get their opportunity in the bubble. But in the bubble tonight is our school-based uh, team members. Um, and so as you discover uh, these injuries, the trajectory is to push them into uh, this UC Health sponsored concussion care program, which has multiple partners well, across the city. And in this concussion assessment clinic, I'm gonna describe to you what that uh, makeup is. Um, but in the background, it's just one of the first steps because we have a team of multidisciplinary players that are also part of that recovery. Uh, and as you heard me just mention, four to six percent may need that additional attention with these other team members. So the strategy, you saw it in the opening slides, it's the discovery, the assessment, the alignment, and the treatment. Um, these are the four pillars of the program. And in those four pillars, we have striking uh, and, and important members that are um, facilitating that, uh, that strategic approach. So in our discovery arm, um, you know, tonight, uh, is really bringing home a message to parents and coaches and athletic trainers, uh, our school nurses, um, you know, that we have a role here uh, to identify uh, our athletes when they're injured anywhere in our school environment, uh, at home, and what have you. Um, and this education tonight is targeting that. Um, we're going to pivot and talk about the concussion assessment clinic and their roles, but also in this access arm, as you've heard me say, I've reached out to our urgent cares across the city of ours, um, our emergency room is, uh, and our UC health team members to really look at how to better refine our skill set and our approach to concussion. And then I need to align all that to your primary care managers. I myself am a primary care manager, as you heard in the uh, introduction. I have my own practice. Uh, and so it's important to me to link that, that family member back to their primary care manager to make sure those accommodations, um, as we just described, are finalized and formalized for the school. Um, make sure that our brain step team members are being aligned in this discussion with the school. So this alignment pillar is really important. And then the treatment arm. Um, this treatment arm goes above and beyond in identifying the additional team members from neurology to myself as a sports med physician to uh, other rehab partners in OT and speech uh, and neuropsych and neuro-ophthalmology. The whole team falls into this multidisciplinary uh, pillar. So in our concussion assessment clinic, please to kind of draw your attention to a couple facts. Uh, and this has been developed and, um, and been uh, staffed deliberately to really underline all the effort in the discovery of these injuries. We couldn't lean forward further enough to assure you quick access, 24 to 72 hours from discovery, uh, a referral uh, in any role, whether it's coming from urgent care, whether it's coming to an emergency room, or from your primary care ma uh, manager, um, that referral pulls a trigger where insurance uh, can then allow us to get your athlete into this concussion assessment clinic. And in 24 to 72 hours, you will get a call with the uh, invitation to come in for a formal assessment. This formal assessment comes at the hands of a neurophysical therapist. Um, these therapists are specially trained in neuro physical therapy. They have uh, a great uh, and vast uh, skill set that looks at the brain and how it's functioning uh, and where in that function the deficits lie. Again, I'll take you back to that earlier slide where I showed the brain and its ocular impairments and its executive impairments, its balance impairments. 
that therapist is looking across the entire surface of the brain and delineating where that impairment lies and categorizing that impairment so that in the end of the assessment, they're then establishing a plan of care, a plan of care that will be encapsulated and connected back to your primary care manager so that additional care can be extended or recommended. The committee that I introduced early on and subgroup and then the larger committee that we meet every two or three months really feels that this evaluation in all that entails includes both the physical, the emotional and the cognitive assessments of your athlete. So that's relevant to you know making sure there's a full concussion assessment. Um, and of course, that pre that post concussion symptom scale is part of that assessment too. Their focus in the concussion assessment clinic carries across these three areas, these, these bubble circular areas from vestibular to ocular to cognitive to tra trauma, trauma migraine, so the C-spine and the emotional aspects as well as balance. So they're looking, as I've mentioned, across all these trajectories in the injury complex uh, for concussion. So rest assured you're getting a comprehensive expert assessment of a concussion that in the, in the formalities that it represents, we want to make sure we don't miss any symptom and any opportunity to deliver care at the right time to the right cause. This slide I left in, this was one of the slides that I spoke to uh, with our urgent care providers, ED providers, just simply stated, you know, within the UC Health system, we're able to communicate and, and pass referrals electronically. That referral that would come to the concussion assessment clinic is very swift and easy through our EPIC uh, electronic uh, medical platform. Um, but we realize in this city of ours, we have many members, Matthews Vu, you heard me mention Optum, that are not on the same electronic medical record. So we have a rapid fax uh, format formation where um, patients can follow into uh, a fax referral to the concussion assessment clinic and that speeds that identification and awarding of a, a referral. We also are working with Peak Vista um, to get our underinsured and uninsured uh, injured athletes uh, quickly identified and then also into the same referral queue. So many of you out there in D20 may have no issues or concerns with insurance and there may be a segment of you that do. Um, this program is a citywide program. It is for everybody. Uh, and so however that represents you in your insurance and formation, um, please know we have solutions across the spanning of what that insurance represents. So getting to the final slides in, in the deck, we're almost done. Um, as you've gotten through a comprehensive assessment and you've made strides through your treatment plan, now we're at a point in time where you've returned back to school. Uh, our athlete uh, is performing scholastically uh, to appropriate and regular standards of their normal performance. And the question arises, when can they get back to play? And, and this is a good question. We, we see it played out in professional sports. Uh, those of you that are watching football now, um, you know, Andy Dalton with uh, the Cowboys, uh, and you hear it mentioned in our newsreels uh, here, uh, about his return to play progression. You know, Andy Dalton is in the return to play progression. Well, guess what? The return to play progression applies to everybody uh, and it's an international um, standard. And so there at the bottom of the slide, you see that return to play progression. I will tell you your athletic trainers are exquisitely trained and, and should be very uh, comfortable in executing each of these steps. They are followed over the course of a one day period um, where each step is uh, applied, symptoms are reviewed. As long as the symptoms of concussion that we've reviewed earlier don't represent themselves um, in our setting, then um, they can progress to the next step. And so you see light aerobic exercise is step two once we resume activity. Step three gets into sports specific exercise. Uh, step four gets into non-contact training drills. And so that puts you back on the field and negotiating both um, agility drills uh, as well as um, skill based drills. Uh, and then step five gets you into a full contact practice before you resume play on day six or step six 
uh, where you've had no symptoms in the preceding periods, and that's where your play can start. Um, off to the side, you see mentioned that the concussion assessment clinic is ready, is available to all of you out there in club sports, in unorganized sports, um, where you might not have an athletic trainer or coach who can do this for you. The concussion assessment clinic on referral, again, from your primary, um, can do that return to play assessment with you just the same. So for sure, we wanna get you back to class, but we also wanna get you back to your sport with the appropriate progression. So here's the takeaways. Number one, we're talking tonight about sports or activity concussion, and I underline the fact that this is a functional brain injury, and hopefully that came home strong. Early intervention is the way to go with this, in, in, this injury, and I can't applaud you enough tonight in what you've done to spend this time with me to think about what we could do better with sleep and nutrition and accommodations and what we can do beyond that 48 hours to start some very mild activity. Um, we talked about prolonged symptoms, and these are the symptoms that I want you to identify early on, athletic trainers and coaches, because these are the ones that we've got to get uh, identified and, tr and channeled into the concussion assessment clinic so that this opportunity to recover in the 7 to 10 to 14 days is more common and not wait four weeks later to start an entry point in care. And then finally, we're particularly uh, attentive to our children and adolescents in the scope of the return to sport. We know here in Colorado, the Jake Stakenberg um, rules apply. And with that congressional um, uh, law, we've got to follow a, a progression. We've got to follow the, the natural course where these athletes are given the opportunity to demonstrate that they are symptom free before they actually return to sport. Here's the additional resources that I uh, spoke to early on in my entry slide with objectives. I'd highlight the fact that we do have a web-based resource uh, platform and that web-based platform has more information for you to go to uh, and identify. And for sure, Martha, you know, if these slides can be made available, they're for you and, and D20 to use as you wish uh, in any way. Here's that partnership Martha identified in the beginning. I cannot be more proud of our team members you know, in this uh, era of COVID-19 and the sharing of resources and the sharing of information, uh, this burden of medicine in our in our city couldn't be greater. And um, how is it that we can come together uh, with partners like this and tackle uh, not just COVID-19, but other problems that we, we face? And I think concussion care is uh, ripely suited to do that, as you heard me talk through tonight. Uh, I'm going to just put here and leave on the screen our uh, enrichment series. This is that safe play series that Kevin Roberts is, is our principal um, planner and developer. Uh, it's, I'm a, uh, pleased to be part of that team and uh, we'll be back on the 26th to talk more about vaping. I'm going to pause there. Uh, I think we got some questions that we can start with. OK, good. So the first question, uh, and, and I appreciate it, I didn't mention where the concussion assessment clinics are located. Um, so there are six total located across the city. Uh, their locations include up north uh, on the Briargate campus uh, of UC Health. Um, they're located at Matthews Vu uh, Medical Campus up north. Uh, they're located uh, Scarborough. Um, out in the Powers Corridor, uh, we have a location. We're located in the wonderful Printers Park Medical uh, Plaza um, uh, in that building up on the second floor. And then finally in Memorial uh, Central in the center of city right next to the uh, Olympic uh, Training Center, um, we've got our sixth location. Uh, I also would let you know, those of you that are listening in from Woodland Park, uh, apparently the word got out uh, and uh, the community at Woodland Park uh, really made a push uh, to have their own concussion assessment clinic. So I'm pleased to say that um, our Pikes Peak Regional uh, Hospital out there in Woodland Park also sponsors a concussion assessment clinic uh, that has all the same services that I described here tonight. So those are the six locations across the town and then the one out in Woodland Park. Um, second question, does um, docs or does, does every concussion need to be seen by an MD and go to the concussion clinic? Uh, yes, so that's a great question. So 
Uh, I really believe uh, in our uh, school based program that our athletic trainers are a great place to start these assessments. Uh, our athletic trainers have their sideline concussion assessment tools. We call it SCAT. And so that's a great place if we have that uh, opportunity afforded. Um, the second resource that I would put to your attention uh, is the one that I'm going to put on the screen now. And this is called the Concussion Reporting Guide, Signs, Symptoms and Care. Um, this is a reporting guide that we uh, in this group have sponsored and put together. I love it because it goes through your red flags. It goes through your symptoms. It, it has the uh, hotline number on it. Um, and then the other part of it has, wow, it has a way for you, uh, even as a coach, to kind of work your way through some of the memory questions um, and just kind of get a feel for where your athlete is in the scope of problems or concerns. Um, but a physician certainly is well suited uh, to be a natural next step for this, and that um, could be very well where you go. But frankly, a lot of our urgent cares are staffed by wonderful nurse practitioners and PAs, and, and they are particularly well suited to conduct this initial assessment just the same. Um, and that's why in my slide, I, when I talked about the trajectory of concussion care, I really highlighted the urgent care as a very dominant and relevant part to include in your in your uh, movement of care. Um, but your primary care manager, I mean, many people have nurse practitioners and I and I love nurse practitioners in their scope and role. They could very well be a start point uh, if you in fact have a primary care manager as a nurse practitioner. So those are the two questions uh, I have in front of me. Great. Next question asks, would it be possible to get a copy of the post concussion symptom scale? Um, absolutely. Um, those symptom scales um, are available uh, and we'll make them available on our website uh, that we saw early on. Um, uh, Kevin Roberts has been busy about getting those scales in the hands of our athletic trainers. Um, I'll just put the website back on for a moment so you can see that. Uh, for sure, that's a great point. And the urgent cares have those scales also. So when you check in at the urgent care and get your assessment, um, they, you will be handed uh, a multi-day symptom scale to take home with you. And that'll be your bridge to, uh, if you need a visit to the concussion assessment clinic, you'll have that scale to, to take you the next days to follow. Okay. All right, so no questions. Let me go back to um, the scenario. Uh, here it comes. So here again, here's our 16 year old. And now that you've heard the lecture, some things may be relatively more important. First of all, you know, this athlete uh, is presenting to you uh, a day later and and I don't care if it's at the time of the injury or it's a day later, it's still an opportunity to discover um, this injury. Uh, and so as it's stated, um, now she's presenting with this uh, cascade of symptoms, but you notice that her history says that she's had two prior concussions. Um, and so that's a red flag or maybe I, that's that's a, an important point, uh, not a red flag. That's an important point to, to mention because that immediately puts her in the prolonged recovery uh, bucket uh, and that should get attention pretty early. Um, the fog and the balance inst instability, as you have heard now, that puts her in the prolonged recovery bucket. So now she has three uh, items identified that put her in that prolonged bucket. Um, and then we move on to the physical exam um, where I would remark that that athletic trainer did the SCAT 5 on the field and is starting to notice some visual motor deficits. Uh, and so that potentially puts her in a prolonged recovery. Um, gratefully, there's no nerve problems, no weakness, but her visual connection um, with that NPC stands for near point convergence. Normal near point convergence is as close as five centimeters and closer. And so at eight centimeters, we're really seeing an underlying effect of just some visual problems. Um, so I can't say it enough. Um, there are multiple signs in this simple presentation where uh, this triggers concern for a prolonged recovery. And I would say that should get you 
uh, to an urgent care uh, and at least an assessment at that setting um, and get you to get you presented to a referral to that concussion assessment clinic. So I'm going to put the Safe Place series back up and see if there's any more questions. We're right at the top of the hour, seven o'clock. I know there's a World Series happening at some point tonight, somewhere, uh, and uh, and that's probably my next destination, as I'm sure many of you are looking forward to that. Um, I really appreciate the time and opportunity to share this story uh, and this message with you tonight, uh, and I hope it comes uh, to uh, great effect uh, as you you look at this uh, this problem and uh, and apply it in any way uh, to treat athletes. Uh, and to care for loved ones that you, you uh, are uh, near and dear to. Thank you. Good night.